used to not give a fuck about discretion. What the fuck, man? You guys came here to um, listen to Jason and I talk about some stuff that we know something about. Yeah, that's right. And uh, we um, uh, both finished uh, the Mark Lanigan book. Um, you know, yes. uh, sing backwards sing. and weep. That's right. And, um, you know, I think um, based on this, like, text that we've exchanged, um, we have some differing opinions, which I love. Um, you know, not, not, I'm sure we'll find it's the core the same, but um, I want to yeah. say that to anyone who hasn't read this book, um, please read it. Um, you know, the audiobook is great. Um, it's it's uh, Mark Lanigan reading it and he's got like a great voice and um, the dialogue is, is, is really well done in his, in his voice too. I thought that was cool. Yeah. Um, uh, but it's all like, hey man, bro, yeah. dude. <laughs> it's, it's pretty funny. Um, but I thought it was a really good book and, you know, I thought it was written well. I, I wish that it had gone past um yeah. the the point that at which it stops it's basically a telling of his um rise and then ultimate um kind of rock bottom basically is where it right. kind of sums up and it, uh, it kind of ends early 2000s basically yeah 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 with this with the end of the screaming trees um kind of his lane staley's death is kind of like the the last agree, right the last uh part of it that's right that makes sense yeah that's pretty much the historical marker at the end Right. And he does mention, you know, Josh Homme asking him to, uh, to join up with Queens, which, you know, is an interesting thing in and of itself. Like I, I didn't know that he was ever like a, uh, like official member. I thought he was just like one of these floating guys that came in and out and kind of did a couple songs, you know, sang on a couple songs here or there, but, um, outside of that, I'm not really sure what he contributed, uh, particularly to those, early records i mean i the some of the songs that he sings on are like top 10 of my favorites of theirs but oh absolutely i mean he, and you know he continues to sing on records occasionally um i guess he's just not on maybe the last one um and you know yeah i think i heard, i watched another interview with him and he talked about being you know kind of a, a member um for at least through uh, songs for the deaf i remember right after on the next tour for that record they put out this this kind of fake news thing that he that Mark didn't make the plane for the tour, and you know they'd kind of you know. But in the interview, he talks about how he basically you know Josh came to him and said, you know, I think you know we'll continue to have you as a guest on records, but I think that we're gonna kind of keep moving in this direction. Right, um, because he was in some of the promotional photography for Songs for the Deaf. Um, right, but outside of like I said. It, handful of songs that he sings on i i'm not sure exactly what he was contributing to it and it comes across a, a little odd in a live setting like there's that uh there's that really famous video clip of them playing it's right around that time nick oliveri still playing bass um dave girls on drums dave girls on drums troy van lewin doesn't look like a vampire um <laughs> <laughs> it, yes. it, it's it's like i think it's the the reading festival in the uk sure um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so well, he comes out and he does one song, he sings one song, and then you don't see him the rest of the time. Right. So. He was basically singing like three or four songs in the set. They were doing all the, the songs for the deaf. And then I think he's on one. Like Into uh, the Fade. And... Yeah. Yeah. Two songs on, on Radar. So, right. That's yeah. that basically is how, how it was working. And the, in the interview, he talks about how great of a gig it was that he would come out and do three or four songs. Yeah. And he was basically a touring member of the band um, and he was yeah. clean. And so it was uh, it was a nice low stress you know position to be in um, with you know great musicians and and a great group of people um yeah uh, uh, not a lot of obligation for somebody who's going through recovery and probably doesn't need like you know to be loaded with obligations yeah absolutely um even though through most of the book his obligation was you know scoring and getting high yeah yeah yeah. So um, it's so really what what is like after reading the book? What mm-hmm. is kind of your takeaway? Like, what's your thirty thousand foot view of him uh, as a person? Not I necessarily mean, as an artist, but like you know, he kind of reveals a lot of his personality in this. Yeah, I mean, he's kind of kind of an asshole, right? Like, I mean, he's like you know. Um, uh, I mean, if you're a friend of his, like you're, you're Kurt Cobain or Lane Staley or, you know, something like that, you're, you're in like Flynn, like you're, you're good as gold, you know, but like, if right. you're somebody that's like, has this passing or Joshua Hame, who's like, 
becomes his friend, but I don't know, not a drug friend. Yeah. I don't know. He's not nice to a whole lot of people. And, and maybe that's just his, what he carries with him is like kind of the bitterness. So that's what you hear. You know right. what I mean? Um, and so I, I don't know. That's it's, it surprises me that like you like him as much as you do, because in, in my experience, you have a um, like longstanding feud with um, <laughs> redheads with a chip on their shoulder. <laughs> Right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's funny. That's funny. Um, yeah, no doubt. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> that's funny. Um, maybe it's because I'm not exposed to him dealing with him. Like I'm not having to like, yeah. you know, be occupy the same space or, or talk to him in a way that, um, you know, we don't have to go to eat together or something like that, yeah. you know, and I just have to read these. You things. don't run into him at the bar and like have to feign, you know, it, right. Or friendly conversation well. or whatever. Yeah. Right. Right, totally. Um, uh, yeah, no, I, it's strange because I did enjoy the book, and you know, I think I enjoyed it for like it's, it's kind of a, a Mr. Toad's wild ride, you know. Um, and I think that part of it's really cool. In some ways, he, he's guilty of doing the same things that um, Burroughs does with drugs and like glorifies them, even though he's in recovery. Yeah. Um, I mean, he it's it's not like he shies away from like telling you the dirty bits and like like really showing you the, the the shitty parts of it you know right but um uh you know he never really talked about having to like pull through it or um you know like um no he so didn't someone... i mean he essentially paints himself in, in not a great light i mean he was not ultimately responsible for you know like pulling himself up by his bootstraps or anything it's like right just consequential you know circumstance or whatever and he ended up you know, like not, not burning every bridge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's like one left. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's weird too, because like at the end of the book, you know, um, uh, and I don't think this is a ruining anything, but spoiler alert um, for you guys, we're, we're going to start talking about things that, that occur later in the book. You know, um, I was really surprised that Courtney Love becomes a, a, a hero of this portrayal, you know, yeah. um, uh, she is not very rarely painted that way, right? And then, <laughs> right. Um, but then, but someone who is to a lot of um, sobering um, musicians, Duff McKagan is like a, once again shows up as like uh, uh, an angel in this in this whole right. story as as someone who really helps him. Yeah. Um, and and he's well known. This is not the first story I've heard like this. And then Duff becomes a, a, a center point of it. Right. And and you know Duff is also a um, a Seattle guy. So that, right. there's that connection there as well. Sure. But even with, um, you know, when, when Duff was in, um, uh, Velvet Revolver. Thank you, Velvet Revolver. Yeah. Um, you know, he, Scott Weiland, he was really interested in Scott Weiland being in the band because he could tell he was still, you know, struggling with drug addiction and, um, you know, was yeah. really keen on getting him into the, some of the programs he had been a part of and was hoping that his proximity to him would, would be helpful. Uh, and ultimately, right wasn't you know but yeah um and i i really enjoyed the book too um there's there's parts of it that are tough to get through i, I think the initial chapter or two where he's like making up lies about his childhood is kind of uh kind of a I, drag I, and like <laughs> wait wait hold on, hold on i want i want to go back to this part like um see you said this in the text message you were like you know um uh that you know he's just he's like making things up and it's a memoir it's like you know yeah. um, and it's someone remembering their life you're gonna make things up or or misremember them as it were but right. like i don't know um like here you i, I just okay I'm, i want to call you out a little bit like you're saying that he lies about things that you have no prior knowledge of this you just true. think you just think that they're so outlandish that they can't there, be true. there is there is a lot of things in this um that set my bullshit detector off like <laughs> fucking hard and yeah. and you know that's that's one of them like the the stuff about his childhood whatever you can make up whatever you want you can remember it however you want and i understand that this is a memoir and people embellish these stories the whole intention is to sell books and to add like you know salacious bits in there which he promises at the front end of the book and then <laughs> never delivers on it's like you know he he talks about himself like he's some kind of uh like sexual freak and like all this shit and, and it, it, like the stories he tells are not only pretty vanilla for like somebody who was in a in a major touring rock band and a drug addict but like 
they're just kind of run in the mill. I got some pussy stories. <laughs> and I, I just, I was expecting more. So, okay. So that's part of it. Like I said, the memoir thing, I, I understand. This is all intended to, to sell a book. Right. What, what really fucking bugged me more than anything else is like the level of self aggrandizing that was going on. Like him painting himself is more of a fixture of that movement and music than, than I think he really was. I mean, Screaming Trees were not a great band. They were right. a, a middling at best band. Well, luckily um, he, he doesn't he doesn't ever say anything better than that. You know, he doesn't yeah. he doesn't ever make them out. But to it's be never fun. his fault. He yeah. spends the well, whole true. first three chapters just fucking dragging Lee Connor, Gary <laughs> Connor, who is like <laughs> he's not even talked to the guy in 20 years, you know. Right, right. And right, so right. the you know, the, the worst you can say about him is that he's he's probably um Gary Lee Connor's probably somewhere on the spectrum. Right. And well, definitely, like, definitely. It's like a yeah. strange dude. Right. Um, and he goes to very, very great lengths to like just paint him a, in the worst light possible. Like it's always like his fault. You know what I mean? Well, I think he does what you're saying. I think he, you know, he starts off by and when he introduces, he, he, you know, him as a character, or that person, the Gary Lee Connor into the book, he talks about how he's probably on the spectrum about how he's like really different and that, but how, the songs that he were he was writing were really good right. aside from the lyrics like that's right. something he did not like right right um and i do agree that when you encounter the screaming trees in the era where mark Lanigan is writing you get a much better band they're, they're a better band yeah yeah for sure without a doubt and, i wouldn't disagree with that and i definitely think there are some good songs in in amongst that i mean you know i think mark Lanigan in general is um really great but he has it to me there's just one great record in that repertoire you know like as right. far as a, a, a title a, f a full feature work you know and that's bubblegum yeah. and then i think throughout the rest of it there are great songs there are great eps um and then you have a, like maybe one great another great album once you stream through all that stuff yeah yeah um so i think that's characteristic of mark lanigan in general like you have a um, great a greatest hits record that's killer but right exactly exactly agreed and i so i i think that 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 is maybe something he's not self-recognizing but that's right. something that if if there was a you know a depth into like i was waiting to run into the bubblegum recording process you know in that yeah, story never, and that never kind of even thing. mentioned that in the book right exactly and that's something he would have been sober for so it would, there would have been more to it um right you know and i in general i think um that's some of the stuff that i found missing from it. but you know i hold on i want to i want to um, I, I, we were texting about this and I thought, I thought this was really funny. Um, cause I texted, you know, you're kind of complaining about it. And I said, um, um, I go, you mean there's some third string front man telling fairy tales about heroin dealing, bike stealing, tor um, Tourette's having angels. Yeah. And you're like, bing, and hit the nail on the head. Yeah. And I think that's the thing that, um, you know, <laughs> Right. And it, it's part this. and parcel of like this kind of thing. Right. It's, it, it's a mm -hmm. memoir. So you you let it go. Um, when I talk about the self aggrandizing, like part of that to me is like this, um, this junky bravado that if you've ever been around drug addicts, you you've encountered this before. Um, right. And so the one part that really hit me that I go, oh, God, you're, come on, what are you doing? Um, there was a line in there and he was talking about, and it's like when he was first getting into drugs or he had been into drugs for a little bit, but um, Kurt Cobain was still alive. Lane Staley was obviously still alive. Um, right. And he makes some, some offhanded remark that, you know, they both told me that, that I'd never get clean and that they were going to get right. clean. And, and then, you know, so you're talking about two guys that died of their addiction saying that oh you right. you're the worst junkie i've ever seen you're never gonna so it kind of like i don't know it just kind of reeks of bullshit to me well that kind of stuff rubs you wrong all anyway like that statement from anyone else in in other contexts would would rub you wrong that's just probably that for, sure. for you is just not not something that you'd appreciate and even for me was a little hard but you know i think for him to say it like those are you know um he's you know, saying that how these are two of his best friends, right? Um, and let's let's let him take his let's let's let 
that be word be true, right? Yeah. That, that he's telling the truth there. And he's choosing to use words from their their past mouths. Um and and hopefully with reverence. And I think Which again, nobody would. can nobody can contradict that because he's talking about you know private conversations that he had with these people who are dead. So right. there's no way to contextualize or verify or any of it. That, that's true. And but I do think that if what I'm trying to say is that I give him the benefit of the doubt relative to that, because if, if it were me and I was using um, two friends, two were my best friends who had passed away and I'm going to use their words, I would make sure that I was using things that they actually said. You know, I would not attribute things to them that were false. I wouldn't um, be using their words to like bolster my own position though. I agree with you, but I, I'm not sure that, that that was necessarily his points. Like, um, no, that's exactly what it was. I'm a hard ass. I'm the best drug addict that ever lived and I, <laughs> and, I, and I survived. I've been through. So you're telling me that some guy from, again, a middling band that sold like one record, really. I mean, he tells the whole story about, you know, the single soundtrack and how that kind of basically undermined the record that that single was supposed to go on to. Right. Um, you're telling me that you have, a bigger habit than two guys that are legit rock stars that have endless supply of funds in the moment. And, and you're, you're the harder. I, I just don't buy it, man. I'm sorry. It, well, it, it I, I, just kind of fucking rubs me the wrong way. It, yeah. it just doesn't seem true. Well, I guess, I guess the way I took it too was not necessarily that. I mean, and it's interesting too to, for us both to have varying perspectives on this. Um, you know, not necessarily uncommon, but interesting. Yeah. Because um, I took it like more like, um, like he was, like not bolstering his like, or it's not saying like I'm the best junkie of them all, but you know, more like saying, I, uh, you know, that he doubted even himself. You know that he, so using these two people as barometers that he didn't even think that that was legit, like likely to happen, you know? And, and, you know, when he goes through and continues the story of, of, of the depths of his addiction, you know what I mean? He basically lives homeless and is doing all this, you know, stuff. And, you know, he's, he's, you know, even when he's not homeless, he's cooking crack to sell crack to be, to get heroin, to do heroin, you know what I mean? So it's like, right. Well, to do both really. But, um, and so I think, you know, you have someone who, um, I didn't take it that way, I guess, is what the, what the gist of what I'm saying. I took it as a display of even his own doubt, you know, and, and then the doubt, the reflection of doubt of his friends, you know, who died of, of drug problems or, you know, I mean, you know, shotgun isn't a needle, but I mean, Kurt Cobain, you know, ultimately it's blamed on the drug usage, right? Yeah. Um, uh, so I, I don't know, man, that's not the, the vibe I got off of it. I mean, there was plenty of self-aggrandizement and plenty of, um, I think the most... Um, interesting part of it though or the the display of that that was most real was when he tells the story about going to the um uh the merchandise um person's uh hotel room and like like you know like really trying to get money <laughs> trying to get yeah. money and then the yeah. next day about how that person had left the tour and how he's talking to the tour manager like hey man you know me i would never do anything like that and yeah th that part of it that um that junky double talk stuff was yeah, really, yeah, yeah. that, that was, I thought that was interesting because he was telling me that was very true. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. That, that perspective of it was, was so real and, and, and interesting. Right. Well, and I, what I'm, what I'm saying when I, when I say that it, it's to me, part of that, um, it, it's just part of that mindset of like, um, how can I say this? Uh, maybe maybe the point's not even worth bringing up, but well, well, it's you know, I, I get what you're saying. I also junk, think that junkies and addicts like to brag about their intake and their tolerance and uh, how bad it is when they when they get dope sick. All these things are these are things that anybody who's addicted to drugs experiences. But there's always the impetus to like make yours worse do you understand what i'm saying but that's that's true the human condition no matter what 
you know, your experience is always the heightened one is always the one that's like the most or the one that's um, who suffered the most or gosh. Yeah. But let me tell you how much worse mine was. And so right, I think right, that right, that's, right. that's, that's yeah. true in general. It's a lot of one upmanship, right? Right. Absolutely. And, and, you know, let's do it right now. Um, no, but I mean, you know, that's, the, that's the thing. Um, and, uh, you know, but um, let me ask you this. So did you have a part of the book that you thought was like the most, um, maybe it was like the thing you didn't know and that was the most interesting? Yeah. Um, well, I, I think we mentioned it before, but I, I, when they were talking about, um, you know, he talks a lot about Lane and kind of Lane was um, not only was he, you know, very hopelessly addicted to heroin, but he was also like smoking a lot of crack and, you know, kind of, he, he was doing so many drugs that like he was kind of losing grip with reality. And there was, there's a moment in, in the book where he talks about that. Um, during that time frame, though, was essentially when uh, they were recording Mad Seasons Above with, uh, you know, Mike McCready. And I think, isn't, isn't Barrett, doesn't he play drums on that record? Yeah, 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 exactly. The, the, the guy who was the Screaming Trees drummer at the end. Yeah, there, yeah, yeah. yeah so, um, so I didn't know about that. And I thought it was interesting that he because he was around and he kind of helped in the writing process. I don't even remember, like I've not listened to that record in 20 years. So I couldn't tell you whether he actually sings on it or not. He sings on two songs, if I'm not mistaken. Right. So okay. um, it may be three, but definitely two. So as the story goes, as he tells it, um, they gave him full credit for that album. He gets, uh, he was getting royalties as a full member for, for that record. Right. Um, which he claims he was hiding those checks from his accountant and just like cashing them outright and using that to kind of fuel his, his drug addiction. So when he finally did get clean, you know, you got to settle up with the IRS at some point. And they're like, Hey, how about this? You know, I don't know, $50,000 or whatever. Right. That's what he says. It's 50 yeah. grand. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't know about that. I thought that was interesting. Um, I love the story about, um, so, so this is where I get to be a total hypocrite <laughs> as much as he annoys me. I love it. There's certain people. I love it when he shits on, you know? Yeah. So like when he tells this story about Al Jurgensen uh -huh. and what a, what a rotten, awful guy Al Jurgensen is. Um, I'm, I'm like cheering in my car, you know what I mean? Yeah. So th there's, there's a lot of moments like that, that, you know, I, I really enjoyed it. And I ultimately, you know, thought the book was really good, but. You know, it's, it's, so it's interesting because we, and we've talked about this a little bit on, um, and you know, uh, in the book, he talks about uh, Joshua Hame and um, Brody Dale meeting. Yes. And uh, he's really kind of, um, and Brody Dale is there as the, um, she's like the girlfriend of um, Tim Armstrong from Rancid. Right. Um, who I, um, I don't know, like never really liked and like uh, always kind of had this like stink eye on, you know, this like dude, they're the worst. <laughs> yeah. Anybody that doesn't think Rancid is as bad as Blink 182 is fooling themselves. <laughs> like hot topic punk from the I, mean, I don't know it, about it, that bad, but no, it, you know, it is. It is they were never they were it's never like, a, Rancid is Blink 182 with street punk clothes on. They and, got and, costumes on. That's yeah, that's all straight it edge. Is. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm uh, sorry. Anyway, continue. Anyway, um, so uh, Brody Dale is there as Tim Armstrong's girlfriend, and because Rancid is like this um, straight edge and recovering. Um, scene, yeah, all those guys were supposed to be clean now, right? Yeah, and so and so they're all like, um, he tells a story about which isn't very punk, by the way. Where they're where they're walking around him so that they don't have to walk like be on the sidewalk next yes, to him or they, whatever. They 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 uh, went out of their way to kind of like give him a wide berth and make it clear that they were distance in themselves from him because he yeah. was um uh, because they recognized him as being a drug addict right right and he's like well fuck you like i don't like you either and i felt the same way i'm like yeah i would love it <laughs> if they wanted to stay away from me that would be perfect yeah um but like and and that he encouraged josh to like chase down this woman just to kind of in just increase the, the spite yeah, yeah right 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 i thought that was that was great right yeah the oasis story is really good too like you know a, again it's like when the person who's getting the comeuppance is like somebody that you already don't like, it's easier yeah. to cheer for him. You know what I mean? 
Oh, for sure. And, and the other things you can see, um, you know, just because of, you know, what we know about, you know, the Gallagher Gallagher's, you know, yeah. that you, it's completely believable. Yeah. 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 Like it, when he's telling that story that every bit of that rings very true, you know, oh, what absolutely. I mean? absolutely. And everybody that. knows that, that Liam Gallagher was a fucking piece of shit and was well, I, I also like just an that. arrogant little twat. Yeah, 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 and that the, and that they're on tour with them when that band falls apart. I love. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, no, I and think, he also I, goes out of his way to like make it clear that he's like, you know, Noel is a really great songwriter, and, right? You know, he's brother. really the brains of that band, but his brother's a real piece of shit, and you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. good riddance. You know, he, yeah, he 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 doesn't. There's toes he doesn't step on. Makes makes it clear to like uh, yeah. stay off of those gold shoes. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And Josh is one of them too. You know that he doesn't. Um, uh, he's careful with and he's um uh you know he tells a story and i think you know you get the sense that he's telling the story about me and brody dale in a way to kind of honor um his friendship with josh and 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 their marriage at the time and when he wrote the book you know the two of them were married and happy and everything was great right um, and, and now that the relationship's a little rocky uh, in what in whatever condition it's in and who knows um you know there's rumors that they're getting divorced but um you know it it's uh it's a different story, you know, it like definitely like hits a little different. Yeah. But you know, they've been together for a long time and they have children together and stuff. So oh, I mean, they sure. have a life together, you know? Yeah. Regardless oh, yeah. of where it goes. Yeah. I think their oldest, oldest is like 16 or 17 or something like that. So okay. they've been yeah. a number of years together. Uh, and, and, you know, when you're parents of a child, even you may um, get divorced, but you're going to see each other for the rest of your life, you know? So yeah. um, it yeah. is what it is. Right, right. So I I have to agree with you in the fact that I felt like the arc of the book itself um, was a little bit of a letdown, like mm-hmm. the way it, the way it ended. I I did want to hear um, more like redemptive stuff because really, if you look at, if you like piece it out, right, got all the early stuff about like his childhood. And you're like, okay, well, you know, you claim you were he claimed he was an alcoholic as a teenager, like starting very early as a teenager right. and his home life sounds pretty fucking rotten. You know what I right. mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Relationship with his mom, which, you know, um, he continues to bring up throughout the course of the book. Um, so you have that section of it. Then you have like the, the rock star section of it, right. Where it's basically the rise of screaming trees and the, the other bands in that scene right yeah, yeah, yeah. the um, grunge uh, and that rise. coincides with his beginning to delve into drugs and then you know addiction um and he tells some some harrowing junkie stories mm-hmm. um most of them just about being dope sick which is you know i think if you go down to the local methadone clinic you could probably get 50 stories that are um more salacious than than any of the ones that he told but and then it just kind of ends and it's like and then uh and then somebody put out their hand and and i got clean and and that's the end of it but like you said that cuts off 20 years in the past from present day so and i think that maybe if anything i'm sitting here thinking about i'm like you know if anything there's probably an editor waiting to see how this book does to see if there's a uh, uh, part two, you know, like a second half of this this thing that needs to be written. Well, I uh, mean, but does anybody besides us really want to hear about that stuff, like the the positive stuff that's related to music, and not like the the stories about chasing dope and um, getting <laughs> getting fiberglass blisters on your ass for <laughs> sex on a sailboat? I mean, <laughs> oh my god. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I think so. I mean, I think that's like this. I think, well, to me, that's the valuable story, right? You know, that's the thing that um, I'm really curious about. And, you know, um, I, maybe you're right. Maybe that's the stuff that got cut. You know, maybe the editor was like, okay, this here's the book, you know, as we yeah. see it. Right. Um, and this is the story that relates, you know. And, and right now in America, I think that's probably true that that um, addiction um, – and the stories, you know, kind of swaddling it are, um, 
something that that everyone has had some experience with, whether it's a loved one themselves or uh, right. they've seen it on the news and thusly they want to um, live vicariously but not actually do it kind of thing. Um, so I think that there's all of that. Yeah, uh, maybe that's what that's what you know that's what they thought would sell the book. You know, um, right, though, right. Though it's not it's not how it was marketed. So that's one of the things that I thought was interesting. There's a really big disconnect between. Um, the book, the way it was marketed. Um, and yeah, it does what... not come off as a very redemptive tale. I mean, no, no, but I but mean, he... yes, he, he gets clean eventually, but that's like, you know, big, big fucking deal. Talk about what you do after you got clean and right. how yeah. your life was better or how your art was better or whatever, you know, uh, yeah. that's what I wanted to hear about. Um, one, one of the stories he tells, and I, I, it just occurred to me, I want to bring it up while we're, while we're talking about it. Um, he tells a story about uh, them performing on one of the late night shows. Leno, Jay Leno, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so he explains like the way that that works, and um, that from like a behind the scenes perspective is really interesting because you realize, yeah, the they're not they're not playing live in front of an audience. They're doing, you know, three, four, five takes of a single song, and then. Um, and then they cut it together and that's that's the way it goes out on air so that was interesting but he tells the story to preface it you know and he's saying that it was a terrible performance they uh you know two years after this album has been out they still want them to perform i nearly lost you right um which he was okay with because he knew he could hit the notes in that Right, because he was sick, and he like, yeah, was was, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he tells this story about nodding out in his hotel room and like sleeping with his head down. Well, back, right? So, yeah, so like, like his, hanging lower than his body. Right. Yeah, like off the edge of the bed. Right. Off the edge of the bed, and that caused some kind of uh, Godzilla acid reflux that nobody else in the world has ever had. <laughs> 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 it created you know a giant problem for him and and ultimately he has to sing this song off their new record that um that he's a little concerned in, in his condition he won't be able to perform properly right um i i went back and watched a youtube clip of that performance okay it wasn't just me okay so did i okay go ahead yeah and it was good <laughs> oh you thought this you thought it was he was actually a good performance yeah yeah, I, I felt like he was talking, he was like talking down his the performance somehow. I don't know. Oh, he definitely was. I mean, he says he, yeah, comes, yeah, yeah. he gets called to the couch and that, um, uh, um, you know, I forget who it is, but like an older actor whom he recognized and liked um, said, you know, oh, that was a pretty that good That wasn't try. so bad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, I didn't Young think, fella? I didn't think the performance was bad, but I didn't think the sound was bad. Like I yeah. thought the... Um, Overall, the, the quality of what they what was being put out or recorded and gone had gone to air wasn't that great. Right. Um, but his his performance didn't strike me as particularly not, like wasn't off key or wasn't you know what I mean? Right. No, I, I, I agree. Um, I didn't I didn't think it was it was and awful. he really didn't look any worse for the wear in that clip either. Well, what's interesting is I started going back and looking at pictures and um, and, you know, clips and stuff of that era. And, um, you know, it, it tells you something. There's not a lot of screaming tree stuff out there. Um, so yeah. that, that, that says something, right? Um, but um, also that uh, he, um, like, I don't know, he doesn't ever look too terrible. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, like, he doesn't uh, look uh, like what we expect from somebody that is right. as strung out as he paints himself being in the book. Yeah, yeah or just like how, how bad he's doing it. And I guess maybe he's young. I know, but dude, you've, you've known you've known drug addicts yeah for sure you know what it does to your physical appearance right yeah oh absolutely but i mean i mean there, certainly there are anomalies right there are people that just have different genetics and they yeah. you know drink for their whole life and they never look any worse or, you know i'm yeah. just kind of pulling for examples here but um i i agree with you that you know looking at older pictures of him from these eras that he's talking about, he doesn't look particularly, he looks worse now. <laughs> he, does. he looks really bad now. Yeah. I also would style him he looks, differently. He looks way more like a drug addict than, you know. He does. He does. He looks like he's back on it or something because he does look bad. And he, um, that mustache that he's rocking these days is like oh. so 
fucking weird. It's very bro. Ollie G. He's got an Ollie G thing yeah. going on right now with the. He is Ollie G with the glasses and everything. <laughs> the gold yeah. teeth and shit. Same black suit. Yeah. Yeah. It not whoever I think it, it's probably his wife or something. But like, man, I have some style tips for Mark Flanagan for sure. Yeah, Get at yeah. me, bro. And maybe <laughs> don't 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 dye your hair anymore. I would that's that would be my other suggestion. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it's just really really weirdly red. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, it's like when you see an old lady who's obviously dyeing their hair, and it's like yeah, yeah, bright, like Ronald yeah. McDonald red. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. And maybe maybe when he when he's because he looks like it's really caught up with him. Like he does look really, really old for his age. And um, yeah. so maybe. Well, so is. that's something that you all, that you always notice with people. Um, and I think Bill Burr even did a bit about this, but he's like anybody that did like hard drugs when they're young, like they stay, they stay ripped. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. like Iggy and like, you know, um, Steven Adler. I, I think that's who Bill Burr was talking about at the time. He was talking about Steven Adler, but yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, those guys, those guys yeah. who were like, you know, long term heroin addicts, they, they're all like fucking bone thin and they never, they never like bulk up. Yeah. It's that, yeah. I mean, I always wonder like, I remember reading something about, you know, this is not knowing too much about that stuff too in, in a lot of ways, but like, um, you know, someone saying that physiologically, like Keith Richards was like really like, you know that 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 drug in particular ages you internally a lot but look uh -huh. at keith richards he's like fucking 100 years old and he's still fucking rolling around you know yeah he's been I getting mean, he's been getting blood transfusions for a long long time though um and well, that's, he, yeah, that's well, got to have something to do with you know being able to regenerate because you're killing it 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 hurts your um your filtration just like alcohol yeah. does right? right so that's that's where it does the most damage. Um, although they say that opiates um, can be used in perpetuity, and if 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 not uh, because of like illnesses and things associated with like uh, IV, not uh, not clean IV use, that's where the majority of the problems come from. So these guys either die of overdoses or they get hepatitis or AIDS or um, they get sepsis or blood poisoning, things like that. And most uh, very little of it has to do with heroin as a drug. Now, it may be uh, as a result of like an adulterant that's put into the heroin as a cutting mm -hmm. agent, because, um, you know, we all know that drug dealers are not the most scrupulous folks and you know if they need to cut something down they don't always have the right thing you just kind of kind of make do you know that was an interesting thing that that mark lang and talked about that i didn't i didn't know about um and you know he's talking about injecting and just kind of the the things that come with that you mentioned sepsis but he also talked about something that was um what do they call it cotton sickness or whatever cotton where yeah. cotton fever where you actually yeah. get bacteria from the cotton that grows and then and then you infect yourself with it um, yes that, that i thought was whoa wicked crazy like something you just don't think about um but you know you do consider that kind of usage um of intravenous things and all the like you know all the dingy places that you run into a needle like just think about like the last you know abandoned building you're in you came upon a stack of needles and like you're like people were like putting things in their body in here Dude, they're know? not like, using fucking bottled water to cook that shit up in if you find something if you have a tap that's great but if not you're getting it out of a puddle or you know yeah it's it might not it's even just, be water you know that's uh, so fucking weird and gross um yeah. but i think that that that's something that that was done well in the book is he doesn't like paint it as like a pretty thing you know um yeah but he does like, you know, um, in, in the drug addicts I've known, they all have, um, if they had a process, if it was snorting, if it was injecting, whatever that was. Yeah, there's a ritual. Um, yeah, a ritual. And that, 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 that ritual really has a, a vibe and energy to it in and of itself. Yep. So like when he tells the story about how he would, um, uh, you know, smoke crack and hit the heroin at the same time. Right. Like that, you, you can almost sense him getting high off the retelling of that story. Right. You know, like just like, like he's like really, really like just it's laying like down you and Burke that. sitting in the car doing whippets and smoking weed, trying to <laughs> like just hit that fucking maximum peak. <laughs> That's so funny. That's so funny. There it's the same thing, steps. though, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, no, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. It's the um, same. I, and he likened it to like people who are into sexual asphyxiation, right? 
yeah yeah, yeah. The, you're the trying to game. align these two um these two uh um euphorias in a way that you know that they they kind of uh what would you say well it's just like smack smack you know like like you're putting yourself to sleep and waking yourself up in the next breath you know yeah. and um and so i think that that part of it was really um I don't know. I guess it just you could feel him laying down and getting high and off just the remem- retelling of it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, I mean, it's like, it, you know, any, was, any NA meeting you go to, you know, all the fucking addicts are like, they're still living the, that. You know what I yeah. mean? Going yeah, to yeah, meetings yeah. and telling those stories and you're still getting, you're, you're, re, you're reliving it. You're, um, you're pulling, you know, those memories are powerful. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, and, there and was... honestly, that's another reason I think he's a little full of shit. Because I think if you're if you're fucking that strung out on drugs for that long, I don't know how much you're actually gonna remember. Well, there's that. Um, there's also, I think, how it all runs together. I guess that's the part of it that I give him a little bit of leeway. Like, yeah. I bet some of those stories are amalgams of each other um, sure and, sure sure and, you know like there's like three things that happen that he's really throwing together and everybody does that right. um like the, yeah. the story he tells about his last being in europe being in and and trying to score right? and being yeah. thwarted at every like i don't think all those things happened to him he might have gotten robbed he might have gotten sold bunk dope but like this the situation uh, where like, so, like yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah everything yeah. lines up and it's like just the worst possible scenario uh yeah does that happen in real life where the stars align against you occasionally sure yeah, but but that that one um seemed a little suspicious to me well okay so as i think we should maybe ramp up the mark lanagan thing without without you know now knowing yeah. you need to read the book but yeah. i will say there, there was one thing in particular that i thought that's not a spoiler um, that I thought was really fucking weird and it caused me to kind of go down this other rabbit hole and that's where he ends up hanging out with Anthony Kiedis' dad yeah, um, yeah, yeah, and, and and yeah Blackie and he like he's like this guy looks familiar and I can't fucking figure out why and then he goes in the bathroom and there's pictures of Anthony Kiedis all over the bathroom oh yeah right? I forgot about that he he fucking disses him pretty hard too yeah well you know not when you start looking at what people have to say about his dad that knew him yeah he's not a know, good outside, guy no, not a not a good guy. I mean, anybody who does heroin with their thirteen or fourteen year old is 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 kind of a douchebag in my 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 opinion anyway, right? Agreed. Um. So, um. But that he's like, I don't know. It was just, ugh, it was icky, and and it caused me like to like look into stories about uh, his dad, and that that uh, story is um, not an uncommon. You know, like a lot of people. Yeah, have, there's, people you know, have similar similar. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it was kind of that that part was kind of gross um but um uh yeah weird and and even weirder that he was like uh you know i think i'm gonna get out of here that that grossed him out um after all this you know kind of other stuff that's where you draw the line okay Okay, interesting got it good to know